Hey everyone, welcome back to POA for you. Uh, my name is Leroy, and today I'll be sharing with you Specimen Paper 2021 O Levels Paper 2, Question 4. And the topic is on trade receivables. Now, before we get into it, um, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do so because I'll be uploading new content as uh, they become available. And if you have a friend who you think will benefit from going through these working examples with me, please recommend this channel to your friend. All right, let's get into today's session then. So uh, we have Mr. Or Mrs. Lim that runs a trading business and uh, they have uh, of some information on sales, uh, sales are made on credit, uh, the business terms with their customers, uh, uh, 30 days so customers uh, uh, who buy stuff from them need, uh, need to pay them back uh, after 30 days. Uh, there's no discount offered to these customers uh, for early settlement and usually the customers are getting or paying their money back to uh, Lim uh, after 34 days. Now, there's this new customer that Lim could potentially get and Jennifer uh, operates a business overseas, you know, as opposed to, let's say, customers who operate a business on a local basis. Um, and Jennifer also has been operating for nine months. Uh, uh, it's successful and expects to grow, like, you know, double the business in one year's time. So that's a very good growth rate. Um, the Jennifer is also uh, paying her suppliers on average about 35 days and she has some reference that she can share with Lim should Lim decide to uh, engage Jennifer as a customer. So the question here is whether or not Lim should agree to make a sale to Jennifer on credit and they want three reasons to justify the answer. Well, when I look at this, you know, I intended to agree to give Jennifer a try as a customer. And uh, there are a few reasons for this, right? Because Jennifer uh, operates a business overseas. So that's, uh, and that business is growing. And that's a group, good white space or growth opportunity for me, right? From a revenues point of view. Because if all my other customers are operating on in, in let's say, Singapore or somewhere local, and I have another customer who sells mainly to overseas supply of overseas customers then my geographic coverage of the business has just expanded as a result of engaging Jennifer as a customer um, so that's one reason I see um, and then um, so I'll say yes first reason is what I've just said now the second reason maybe you know if I sell to Jennifer with the payment terms of 35 days, you know, it's quite similar to my current status where I'm collecting 34 days later after the sale, right, for my customers. So it wouldn't shift my liquidity profile uh, of my trade receivables, you know. It's not as if Jennifer's asking for a credit term of 90 days. Right? And that's really, really far off from the current 30 days that I'm extending to customers. Um, so that's kind of my second reason why I think, you know, Lim should give Jennifer a, a try. And I think the third reason is Lim, uh, Jennifer has some uh, independent uh, third party who are able to, uh, who I could make a reference check on. And, you know, if these reference checks go well, then they are a good they are good indicators that Jennifer is a good customer to have. So those are my three reasons. Now, having done part A, let's move on to part B. So part B, um, there's some, there's a credit customer time who, you know, Lim had these few transactions with. So uh, 8th of May, we sold goods to Tan. Tan returned uh, some of the goods. Uh, and Tan paid for some of the goods on the 18th. Uh, Tan paid for the rest of it on the 25th. But then that check that Tan gave us on the 25th was re returned to us uh, because there were insufficient funds. And at the end of the year, you know, Lim said that uh, Tan's business is uh, collapsed, right? Or for whatever reason, Lim had, has decided to write off Tan's uh, outstanding balance. 
So the, with that context in mind, let's look at part B. What is the journal entry to write off the outstanding debt? I think, you know, in terms of um, bad trade receivables, right? There, there are two ways to deal with it. One is to uh, come up uh, to create an allowance for impairment of trade receivables. And the other one is to write it off, um, write it off completely, right? Um, so in this case, a limb has decided to write off, write it off completely because likely there's no possibility of recovering this at all. Maybe Tan's business has really gone bankrupt and closed down, right? So uh, to do this uh, journal entry, this is my journal entries that I have uh, prepared. Uh, you would debit impairment loss on trade receivables because that's an expense item. So that's the expense that will hit your uh, statement of financial performance and you would credit directly into trade receivables to reduce your trade receivables amount and write it off completely. Um, if Tan had said that, no, I don't want to write it off, but I want to instead uh, create an allowance, then this credit will go into allowance for impairment of trade receivables. It's quite different. Okay, so in this case, he said write off in full, so it would directly reduce the amount of trade receivables and this allowance will not be created at all. Now, um, this journal entry also assumes that there hasn't been an allowance that was previously created for Tan. If there was an allowance that was previously created for Tan, then this journal entry will be different then we would debit allowance for impairment of trade receivables and credit trade receivables. Uh, because previously, when you have done the allowance for impairment of trade receivables for time, if that was done before, then you would have created an allowance account and you would have then uh, uh, created an allowance account which is a credit balance and to close that allowance account, you would debit that allowance account. Okay? Um, now, so just on this question, the answer would be this so that you guys are not confused. You create a impairment loss on trade receivables and this is an expense account and you credit it to trade receivables to bring down that trade receivables balance that's uh, pertaining to time. Now, the amount, how did I get 350? So 800 is the starting point, right? Because we sold goods to him at 800. Less 200, all right? 800 less 200, which is what the uh, returns uh, represents the returns, less 250, which is what Tan paid, that would uh, give us an outstanding of 350. Okay, next, uh, part C, explain why a business may decide to make an allowance for impairment of trade receivables. So an allowance is different from a write-off. Right, an allowance is to uh, the double entry for allowance. First, you know, we, we spoke a bit about it is to debit trade receive uh, impairment loss on trade receivables and credit allowance for impairment of trade receivables. Right, I call it TR. So, the difference between this is write off, this is creating an allowance. Right, uh, for impairment of trade receivables. Right, um, the the entry to the the debit entry to the um, to the statement of financial performance is always the same. Which either way, whether you write off or you create an allowance, but the credit entry when you write off reduces trade receivables right away. But the, when you create an allowance, it creates an allowance account. Um, so that you know, while you reduce the net receivables balance, uh, you are creating a contingency that you know this uh, debt may turn bad. So, why do we create an allowance instead of writing off? Because, uh, or why do we create an allowance per se? Because you see a risk that you know the the trade receivables may not be paid to us. And if there's a risk that it may not be paid to us, then um, you will create this allowance 
that brings down the trade receivable balance in the statement of financial performance right and if you don't uh, if you don't know what I mean by that take a look at my videos on financial statements uh, where I'll show you the statement of financial performance and how the allowance fall in uh, in this statement um, there, there could be a situation where these allowance could be reco uh, recovered as well and uh, where these balances um, may not be entirely bad it's just facing a temp the customer may be facing a temporary uh, liquidity issue um, but you're just being prudent so you would like to create an allowance um, but it may have a possibility of future recovery okay so that's why now one accounting theory which apply when making an allowance for impairment or trade receivables um, I may have said that word uh, just if you recall yes it's the word is prudence prudence principle and prudence would mean you know you rather uh you you don't want to you make sure you don't want to overstate a balance uh especially an asset or understate a liability right so uh trade receivables is an asset and if let's say you think that the asset has risk of collectability then you would want to create an allowance uh, because you don't want to overstate the asset. Um, if you did not, you know, if you did not um, put in an allowance, then you are saying that the 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 entire trade receivables can be collected, which may not be true. Then you're not being prudent, right? So that's the whole prudent principle. Hope this is helpful. Um, I think that's we come to an end not for this. Um, if you have any questions, post it on this channel or email me at poa for you at gmail.com. My email address is always on the top left of uh, the materials that I use for these presentations. Um, and if you like this video, like they say, give it a thumbs up. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you and all the best.